Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. Each week we endeavor to bring you a new interview with someone who's been deeply influenced by the writings of Henry Nouwen, and sometimes we bring a recording of Henry himself. We invite you to share the daily meditations and these podcasts with your friends and family. Through them, we can continue to reach our spiritually hungry world with Henry's writings, his encouragement, and of course, his reminder that each of us is a beloved child of God. Now, let me take a moment to introduce today's guest. Today on this podcast, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Ruth Haley Barton. Ruth is the founding president of the Transforming Center, a spiritual formation ministry dedicated to strengthening the souls of pastors, Christian leaders, and the organizations they serve. Ruth is a retreat leader, author of many excellent books, and also a podcaster. I have really enjoyed talking with Ruth before on Henry Now and Now and Then, and now she has a new book out that I think you're going to find incredibly insightful, inspiring, and challenging. It's titled Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest from Sabbath to sabbatical and back again. Ruth, it's so good to have you with us. Oh, great to be with you, Karen. This book arrived in my hands when I really needed the challenge and wisdom it offers. What compelled you to write this book? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, A couple of things, you know, I have written on Sabbath in other books. So I've written a chapter on Sabbath in Sacred Rhythms, and I also wrote a chapter on Sabbath in Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. And so um, I had the opportunity. So I've, I have really embraced the practice of Sabbath for a long time in my life. Then I received my first sabbatical. And when I came back from sabbatical, I really wanted to write a book on sabbatical. And the publisher said, well, yeah, you know, that's kind of niched. What would you think about writing a book on Sabbath and sabbatical? which I agreed to do. And I'm glad that I did because I realize now more than ever that sabbatical is really an extension of a Sabbath practice. It's a part of a whole life uh, Sabbath practice. And so um, you don't, it's it's hard to even know how to engage sabbatical if you haven't had some experience with Sabbath because the dynamics are the same. Sabbatical is just an extension of a Sabbath life. And so um, that is one reason because I wanted to write on sabbatical. But then um, another reason for this Sabbath book is that um, what I have been pondering a lot is that I think people today think that Sabbath is primarily a personal discipline. And I don't believe that it is. And in fact, I think that in many cases, the church is actually working against a real Sabbath practice because the church lacks an understanding that the practice of Sabbath is supposed to come through the community. It's given to a community. It's to come through a community. It's supposed to be led by the most, uh, by the senior leader, the anointed leader in the community. And so when I realized in a period of time when I wasn't on staff at a church and I thought, okay, good. Now, as just a normal parishioner, I'm going to be able to practice the Sabbath. And then there were so many activities on Sundays in that church that we couldn't even, as a family, practice Sabbath, not because of the secular culture or the pull of the secular culture, but because of the way the church culture was structuring itself. And so I thought, man, I really do need to write about the communal nature of Sabbath and how um, communities can practice Sabbath together and how leaders who are living in sane rhythms of work and rest can lead such communities. So that's why now and why this topic right now. It's interesting because I have always loved what I see in the Jewish tradition, mm-hmm. you know, in mm-hmm. an Orthodox tradition, Sabbath begins at a certain point and, and the right. whole family's involved. And I think that's terrific. Mm-hmm. You set out to do this in your life. How did your family take to it? I'm curious. Mm-hmm. What did yeah. they do with this? I mean, it's one thing to say Sunday or whatever day is going to be my Sabbath. Does everybody have to agree and come on board? What what mm-hmm. happened in your life? Yeah, well, in my life, I came into the sense of invitation to Sabbath when um, my children, I have three daughters and they were teenagers and um, they already had their, their priorities set. And so I somehow, by God's grace, determined that I would not impose Sabbath on them, but that I would practice it winsomely enough that they might feel invited to. 
So I began practicing. Um, my husband didn't have much awareness of Sabbath either. So I didn't try to convince him of anything, but I shared with my family what I was going to be doing and how I felt invited by God to begin entering into this practice and then just began to practice um, in a winsome and inviting way. And um, I think that was God's grace to me. I don't think I thought about it all that clearly, but I did have a sense that because it was such a gift, it should not be imposed that uh, people should enter into Sabbath because they feel invited by God and because they sense the goodness of it, they sense their need for it. Um, it's not a practice to impose on people, even people that you love a lot. And so I did not impose it. Um, but my daughters began to really appreciate the person that I was on the Sabbath because I was a completely different person on the Sabbath. <laughs> and they're like, well, when she's like that, we want to be around her. <laughs> and um, and eventually my husband definitely felt drawn and we we do practice Sabbath together now. And it's really, it's really delightful. You use the phrase, the gift of the Sabbath. Why don't you just open that up a little bit to us? Yeah. What do you mean the gift of the Sabbath? Yeah. Well, when I was being raised in a pastor's home, we did practice Sabbath, but we did so in a quite legalistic way. Um, and so a lot of the pleasures and delights that th things that we would naturally enjoy in life, we weren't allowed to do. And because I was a pastor's kid, our family was busy serving God on the Sabbath. And we often hosted people in our home. And so that meant that we went to church in the morning and then we hosted people all afternoon. Then we went back to church at night and the women worked really hard to do that hosting because it was a pretty traditional environment there in terms of the way that the duties were um, sort of sliced up. So I did not experience the Sabbath in that way of practicing it. I did not experience it to be a gift. I experienced it more like an obligation and more like drudgery. So I kicked that practice to the curb. I was practicing many other practices, but I did not <laughs> want to practice Sabbath. But then um, in my early 40s, uh, God kind of knocked me off my horse. It was actually knocked me off my bike and got my attention. I'd been reading books about Sabbath that were really beautiful, like Wayne Mueller and Rabbi Heschel. But I just didn't think it was for me. I, I was an overachiever. And so I didn't I wanted to use that seventh day for my achievements and keep working and um, I, I just wasn't attracted to it in any way, but eventually I got tired enough that I began to really long for it. I began to long for a day of rest like that. And reading those books, I began to realize that it's not an obligation. It's actually a gift from the heart of God to his beloved children, because God created us and God knows how he created us. We're not created to go 24 seven week in and week out. He didn't make us that way. He knows who we are and he knows what we need and that uh, the gift of Sabbath is indeed a gift from a heavenly parent who loves his children and wants us to have the very, very best. So Sabbath begins with God. Um, and I think that's really important. I think one of the reasons I was able to kick it to the curb for a while was because I convinced myself that it was a Jewish practice, but it's not. Um, the Jewish people were the first people to get to practice it, but God was the first one to practice Sabbath, and it comes from the person of God. And in fact, one of the things I say in the book is that when we practice Sabbath, we are actually participating in God's very nature, which I think is just absolutely thrilling. Um and then I realized the more I read about it, that um, it was a, a gift to the Israelites first. It wasn't a commandment in the beginning. The Sabbath was given before the Ten Commandments were given. And that was God establishing a people for himself and saying, I got this great thing I want to share with you. And of course, for the Israelites, it was not just a gift, but it was the sign, symbol, and the reality of their freedom and liberation from oppression. So to them, the the idea that they could rest ra rather than being... Um, completely governed by those, you know, Egyptian taskmasters must have been the most amazing feeling. They had never had a day where they were allowed to rest. They could only mm -hmm. live their their lives on the terms of the pharaohs for them, uh, making bricks without straw and things like that. And so finally, God says, no, you're a people too, and you deserve a day for rest. So I don't know, my, my digging into scripture did really, really uh, unfold for me a sense of the gift of it versus the obligation or the commandment of it. It's so interesting when we go right back to Genesis and we mm -hmm. see God choosing it for himself and his That's delight right. mm -hmm. is that, you know, his sense of delight in it. Mm -hmm. like, things are good. Yeah. And you rest right. mm -hmm. and you rest and that's good yeah. too. What does Sabbath look like in your life? Tell me about mm -hmm. how you practice this. It's one thing to, the word sounds good, but mm -hmm. tell me, how do you make it a Sabbath? Yeah. 
Well, I do think that the 24 hour period is a good period of time if you can accomplish it. And in the Jewish tradition, it started on Friday night because that was the beginning of their Sabbath. But I think for Christians, many of us have more of a possibility of starting our Sabbath on Saturday night, you know, into Sunday. Um, and so to begin with a special meal or something and to say to those that you're with, we're starting, you know, um, I like to start with dinner on Saturday. And at that point, go ahead and unplug from technologies and things like that. Um, obviously it looks very different now when it's just my husband and I at home versus when we had a family. So we are able to do it a little bit more on our own terms, but ideally for it to start on Saturday evening is important, um, to get that 24 hours and to start with resting. Um, so for, you know, depends on when church happens for you, but, uh, for some people who have Saturday night, church, I think that can be really ideal because you can actually start with worship and then you don't have to get up the next day and put your face on and get all dressed and corral your family and get them out the door. But um, the other way works as well because then you get some rest and letting go um, and a good night's sleep on Saturday night before going to worship with your family on Sunday. So, you know, you can make that part work for you in either way. Um but then, you know, the rest of the day is just spent on the things that are restful. Um, and for me, I'm I'm always very tired by the time I get to Sabbath. And so it does begin with rest for me, a good night's sleep, um, being on the couch, um, under a blanket, reading books for pleasure, um, a good Sabbath. On a good Sabbath, there's going to be some journaling, you know, me talking to God just for myself as a human versus how... I do my life during the week, giving out so much during the week. And so I, I look forward to that. And, and in fact, one of the things that I include in the book at the end of every chapter is this little section called what your soul wants to say to God, because I think ideally on the Sabbath, you get quiet enough and rested enough that you can actually say something to God. That's true. And you know, there's a sense of communing with God and being with God, um, not necessarily as a solitude practice, but but really getting in touch with your love for God and God's love for you as a, as a creature, as a human being, not just as a human doing. Um, I think there's also a sense of wanting to look at not only just what's restful, but also what's delightful and what's delightful for body, mind, and soul. So I invite people to pay attention to what they like to do in their bodies. Could be napping, could be lovemaking, could be going for a relaxed walk, could be going for a bike ride, could be going fly fishing, bubble baths. I mean, whatever it is that that is really pleasant and pleasurable in our bodies, because God gave us our bodies and gave us the pleasures of living in a body. Um, rest for the mind, I think that there's, or delighting the mind. Um, we stop thinking so hard. We know we set aside those things that create stress and worry um, and seek to do those things that are restful and replenishing for the mind. So for me, it is a good Sabbath when I've gotten to read a book for pleasure or when I get to read poetry, because poetry for me is just pure creativity and pleasure with words. And I love words and I work hard with words during the week. So to enjoy words on a different level on the Sabbath is, is really lovely for me. Um, one of the aspects of resting the mind for me right now is that um, I've determined not to uh, let the 24 hour news cycle be a part of my Sabbath, because that's also a way to rest my mind from what creates worry and strife and stress within me. Cause most of the news is not good these days and yeah. I'm connected with it the rest of the week, but I don't need to be on the Sabbath. So that's a rest for the mind sort of thing for me. Um, and what about then, becoming unplugged? What do you, what yeah. do you do with oh, that? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, I do unplug, like I, I turn off my technologies and, and I've been turning, turning off the computer, setting the computer away for a long time, because to me being on emails almost symbolizes my work. And I think for all of us, it does, it, it allows in those things that I don't have much control over. Cause then it's whatever anybody wants to send me comes into my world and into my psyche, uh, through emails. So I do, I don't, I haven't opened up an email on a Sunday for 20 years. Um, but now I've also taken to figuring out how to unplug from my phone as well. And I think for most of us, we even have our email on our phones now. So our work is ever present. And so in my mind, um, unplugging from e email and technology is a way of unplugging from work, but it's also a way of resting the mind from all that comes at us um, and the stimulation and um, even just keeping it near us. Like I, one of the things that I encourage people to do really concretely in the book is to try some things like 
try sleeping with your phone next to you and then sleeping with your phone away, you know, in another room. Try going for a walk with your phone, then try going for a walk without your phone. Try having lunch with a friend with your phone and then, you know, lunch without your phone and see what the difference is. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things I've noticed that is in all cases, if I don't have my phone, I'm way more present, way more relaxed, way more restful. So certainly on the Sabbath, um, I, I have to work creatively with that, with the people that I love. But there's a whole chapter on that in the book because it's practical and it's a need that we have, I think, to unplug in order to rest our minds. You speak of in the book about lying fallow. Uh, which is kind of an old fashioned phrase that a farmer would know. Mm -hmm. But let's unwrap that a little bit. What does it mean Mm -hmm. to lie fallow? I mean, you're a very productive person. I can see that. You can. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you could be a driven person mm-hmm. in terms of all that. You're oh, going to I am. I can just day. say that it's not yeah, good. I, and I know that. I I, I yeah. see it in you, and I recognize mm-hmm. it in me. So I can mm-hmm. recognize it in another. That's why we but, get along. <laughs> yeah. But what what for you does it mean to lie fallow? To mm-hmm. unwrap that for me. Yeah. Well, I use that phrase in the part of the book where I'm talking about sabbatical because sabbatical really does come from agriculture. It comes from the agricultural world where one season every seven or maybe more, I don't know, but, and I live in Illinois and we are farming country here. So um, I have seen, you know, fields that are lying fallow. And what that means is that you're saying that the ground can't keep producing year after year after year. It can't maintain its nutrients. It can't maintain uh, what it needs in order to grow things. And so the idea of sabbatical, which is, you know, a longer time away from work every seven years actually refers to letting a, a you know, to letting a field lie fallow and regain its nutrients, regain its life-giving capacities, you know? And so I think sabbatical is that for the human soul, that you have to let the human soul stop producing things for a while, the human mind and the human soul, and believe that something good is happening while it's lying there doing nothing, that it's gaining its nutrients again, that it's regaining its health, that it's regaining its life-giving properties so that it can be fruitful again. And so to have it come from God and from what we know about agriculture, from the natural world, I think makes it really, really powerful, this idea of sabbatical. It, the book has two parts and you mm-hmm. go to it. You go to the idea of a sabbatical mm-hmm. and I think, oh, what a luxury, a sabbatical. But let's mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about what sabbatical is. Maybe um, you, you've given us a sense by talking about the farming metaphor. What's the spiritual um, biblical basis for sabbatical? Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, if that's from the Old Testament as well, where God does instruct the people around Sabbath, and then the, then he, he also goes on to instruct them that um, that you know every seventh year they're supposed to rest, and you know debts are to be repaid and things like that. So the sabbatical rhythm, that seventh year being an extended period of time off, um, and then the jubilee year at fifty. Um, that that, that there, there's this larger rhythm than just the one day that we see very, very clearly in the Old Testament. And God being God built that into the lifestyle of the people that God called to himself and shaped for himself. And so to me, the Old Testament pattern still continues to speak um, to us today because we're, we're still humans just like the Israelites were. And God is still our creator who knows how he created us. And so this is something that he built in to the rhythms of the people that he formed for himself. And I believe it's something that he has for us as well. And um, I think anyone who's had a sabbatical realizes that there's a different level of rest that you enter into when it's a longer period of time. And the way I transition in the book from the topic of Sabbath to sabbatical is with a chapter title called When Sabbath Isn't Enough. Yeah. Because I did definitely come to a place in my own life where I'd been practicing Sabbath religiously, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, but it wasn't enough. I would get to Mondays and I would really dread the work week and I would feel still tired and I would not even know if I had it in me to accomplish everything that was on my plate to do. And I realized, oh, I just knew inside from my own experience that a a longer period of rest was needed for me to fully come back, you know, to a place of fruitful life and ministry. So I am grateful beyond words for uh, the practice of sabbatical along with Sabbath because not sure that I would still be in my in my chair doing what I do if it wasn't for the sabbaticals that I've been granted. 
it's interesting because um, one of the things you make the distinction about, I've been on a sabbatical, but it was with my husband who was a professor at the time. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, the, the, um, the, it was fabulous. We went right around the world, mm-hmm. but having said that it was um, the publisher parish pressure uh, on, mm-hmm. on uh, academics usually yes. is that you have some project that you have mm-hmm. to get done. And there's a lot of, it's, it's not a rest or a, a rest for the mind. It's just that you're not maybe teaching. It's a different kind of work. Yeah, yeah, it's a different kind yeah. of work that you get to engage in. Yeah. But it's a very interesting challenge to think about sabbatical mm-hmm. as something that God may call you to and what that might look like. And um, and to some extent, I, I found myself going, this is a lovely luxury. But it, to me, I, I mm-hmm. it was in that part of the book where I really saw your strengths. You at the Transforming Center really are caring for and nurturing pastors and congregations Mm -hmm. and spiritual leaders and recognizing the potential for burnout there. Anybody who, you know, every single week, a new sermon has to be provided and and you have to deal with all the pressures Mm -hmm. that come with the church, et cetera. The concept of, of being restored somehow just laying back a bit is, is Mm -hmm. quite, quite exciting. Funnily enough, I think often I have seen in my own life, I've seen seven year increments in the sense that changes happen kind of naturally. And sometimes when those things happen, it's a relief, but it's not been that I got to take a year off necessarily. Mm -hmm. I've, it wet my appetite actually. Mm -hmm. I thought, Oh, what a lovely idea. Mm -hmm. And you have some interesting things to say about sabbaticals. You talk about how to go into them and how to go out of them. I'd love Mm -hmm. to hear from you on that. And then let's talk about Henry now on in sabbaticals because my goodness, (laughs) he he really is in that book of yours. (laughs) Uh He he really is. And that's why I was looking forward to talking to you because you're the first, the closest thing to getting to talk to him. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, so um, I do talk about sabbatical being another gift and it's a gift often from the people that have benefited from your ministry. And so church elders and vestries and things like that can give that as a gift, but it's really a gift from God. It's really something that God intends that's given through the leaders in a place. So I, um, it was actually, you know, even emotional for me to revisit Um, the deep sense of being gifted by the people here in the transforming Mm -hmm. center who wanted me to have that and the staff who organized so that they could carry on without me and the elders who are the, excuse me, the board who raised the funds and blessed me and said, we don't want you to work. We don't want, well, you know, we don't want you to write a thing for publication. I didn't work. I did not work on the Sabbath, which, you know, is so interesting to me that the academic world has sort of hijacked the term. So now in the academic world, as you've noted, it's often just a time to do a different kind of work, like take on a project or do some research or write a book. And there's a lot of pressure oftentimes on the Sabbath. There's no relief from pressure during Mm -hmm. that time in an Mm -hmm. academic uh, sabbatical. And so I am attempting in this book unequivocally to reclaim the language of sabbatical back to its biblical roots and understanding that it is a time for ceasing our work. Um, and for resting ourselves in God in an extended sort of way. So um, yes, I talked about preparation and planning. I I actually feel like it could actually and should perhaps be written into someone's terms of call or into their employment agreement or whatever, when they will get a sabbatical and for what length. And mine was not a year. I've had two, three month sabbaticals, but I, I would say that I think three months is not quite enough. I think four months would be the least amount um, just because it takes so long to let go and it takes your, you know, it takes so long for your body to stop producing the stress hormones. And, um, so there's the time for settling in. And then I think there should be some time built in for actually doing a good re-entry. I didn't do re-entry well. Um, and so I really felt that, um, it was too abrupt. Um, and I've heard other people talk about that as well. Well, what do you think would be a good plan for reentry? How would you, having said you didn't do it well, what would you suggest doing? Or mm-hmm. in actuality, I'll encourage people. It's in the book. You'll find good thing, yeah. good possibilities in the book. Mm-hmm. But what would you recommend for reentry? Well, it depends on your time frame. So if you if you have a year, if you get given a year sabbatical, I would say you could see three or four weeks at the end as being reentry. Um, you know, um, a week or two, you know, if you, if for me three months, I think a week would have been nice if I had planned for the week, um, before I came back to be a time of intentional re-entry with some intentional things built in, like for instance, uh, a, a meeting with my spiritual director where we would actually gather up 
the gifts of sabbatical and name them and claim them and uh, determined to carry into the rest of my life the gifts that have been given on sabbatical. I just didn't, I, I didn't even think to do that. Um, didn't have the guidance to do that. But I do think reentry is extremely important. And even maybe to conclude with a retreat that is meant for claiming the gifts of sabbatical and, and, and even thinking about the gifts you want to bring back and how you perhaps even want to change your life. Um, as you come back, the rhythms of your life, if there's any of that needed also a reaffirmation of sense of call in your life. Um, is my calling the same? Has it changed? Um, you know, things like that, um, I think are really important parts of a re-entry. Um, so that's just, a great question to mm -hmm. actually ask yourself is God calling me to something else now? Mm -hmm. And those and I, are, you know, and, and that's hard because I know a lot of, a lot of churches and organizations don't want to give their senior leader the sabbatical in case they come back and say, bye-bye, <laughs> I had discerned a new call. <laughs> so, I mean, in some churches, they will even say that if you're granted a sabbatical, you're making a commitment to stay for a year after your sabbatical. Um, but then I know other congregations who say, well, if a person comes back and no longer feels called, we don't even want them around for another year. Like if they yeah. really aren't feeling called, we want to free them. So it's, there's different ways of looking at that, but um, I think to come back with a renewed sense of calling would be really important. Either it's a renewed sense of calling to where I've been, or it's a renewed sense of calling to something else, but you don't want to come out of sabbatical without being in touch with your call. You know, it's interesting because if you sort of think about the mountaintop experience of Moses going up and mm -hmm. getting the 10 commandments and you kind of realize that in a sense, getting directions, getting getting a sense of focus. Mm -hmm. Anxiety seems to be at such high levels right now yeah. in people's lives, and um, and a weariness. You know, people are spent because you know they're they're living right out to the edges. I loved. I don't know if do you ever remember the book um, Margin. Yes, I do. But I I mm -hmm. love that image that yeah. somebody writes their life right out to the edge of the page. Mm -hmm. And we need margin around the edges of the page. We need yeah. margin around the edges of our life mm -hmm. to be whole. And yet the tyranny of the urgent will often force us into far too many things in the day, far too many yeah. cares carried. I saw one of the things that triggered your going on a sabbatical and it was caregiving. And yes. I'm I'm really aware Henry now and had lots to give to caregivers. And in fact, we've just done a couple of books that are released with um, InterVarsity Press on caregiving, Courage for Caregivers and Hope yes. for Caregivers. Mm -hmm. Because I have found in my own life, this summer was an experience of it. Mm -hmm. I found in so many others of my friends at a certain age, caregiving does them yeah. in. It's mm -hmm. like the thing you can't not do That's because right. someone desperately needs you, mm -hmm. but it, it just takes the, the margin off the edge of the page for That's your life. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very good way to put it. It's true. Well, let's hear a little bit about you took Henry Nowen's sabbatical journey mm -hmm. as a guide to your sabbatical. Let's hear a little bit about what that meant. <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be a guide, but um, actually it was his story. And it was actually, if you would pardon me saying so, it was actually a guide for how not to do sabbatical, which, you know, I was really, I had never, I hadn't read the book, even though I'd had it on my shelf for a long time, uh -huh. probably 20 years. I may have had that book on my shelf for 20 years, but I'd never had a sabbatical. So I never cared to read the book. So I thought, okay, good. Now that I'm going on sabbatical, I'm going to pull this book off the shelf and get some guidance. And I was surprised to find that um, he seemed to not really know what sabbatical was. And he worked very hard on a number of different levels the whole time. And the theme of his exhaustion just jumped off the page. Why am I so tired? I'm still so tired. And he, and he was so torn and conflicted about his need for rest but also his desire to produce. And, and I, you know, in my humble reading of it, it seemed almost like um, an, an addiction to produce. Like he couldn't stop, even though he knew he wanted to, he knew he needed to, he'd been mm -hmm. given the freedom and the resources to do it. His community had freedom to do it, but he still couldn't do it. And so I will say that I felt companioned by Henry Nowen because his struggle it was so understandable and mirrored my own, but at the same time, I didn't necessarily feel guided um, in reading that resource. <laughs> so, uh, but, I, but I've been wanting to talk to you about that and, and your perspective <laughs> on that. And those of you who really were close to him, even during that time. 
Well, I think one of the things we know, I mean, he comes to the end of the sabbatical and he dies. He dies. And That's exactly he, right. his heart is just, mm-hmm. you know, he, he had, was having all the signals mm-hmm. that he needed to pay attention, that he yeah. was so tired, that there mm-hmm. was, there were issues, but, mm-hmm. but his longing for people is his vision to create. He wanted to do this book on the trapeze. He was mm-hmm. just, you know, he, that, that was Henry. He was wired tight, like, yes. like probably like mm-hmm. you're wired and I'm wired. Yeah. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a little bit of that. I think what we tend to love about Henry's writing, even in the sabbatical journey is we love his honesty. Yes. Mm-hmm. He doesn't hide and put forward a self that you kind of go, oh, that's very tidy. Mm-hmm. He lets you know, okay, I'm struggling. Yeah. I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. This is my struggle. And that, that really truly was a journal. I mean, mm-hmm. it really was. They, pulled it together after he died, I believe. I, I think that's what happened. No, that it's, is true. It, that That is said in the book and some of yeah. the back or front matter. So yes, it's true that they published it after. And they, I think, took out a lot too. I mean, it sounds like it's quite abridged that his yeah. journal was much bigger and more voluminous yeah. than what we end up with in the writing. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it is the struggle that I, you know, I say in the book that even though I didn't necessarily feel guided, I felt that I, I felt intimate with the man himself because yeah. he was writing so honestly about a struggle that many, many of us can relate to. I've always found some of my favorite books of Henry's are his mm-hmm. journals yeah, because of the level of honesty in them. They just undo me. I think my very first reading was the Genesee diary and mm-hmm. I got something, I got a, an email this past week from somebody who takes the sabbatical journey mm-hmm. and reads it once every year mm-hmm. because it so speaks to him, uh, yeah. which I thought was quite interesting. But uh, clearly Henry, you know, had a struggle between wanting to be so productive of wanting to write, of wanting to contribute, of, yeah. you know, that, that was his gifting. And, and he so wanted to be with his friends. And, you know, yeah. Clearly, you can see the complexity of it all, you know, <laughs> as you read that book. Mm-hmm. How yeah. has Henry in other ways influenced you? I'm curious because I he's a I, I know I've come across it before in your mm-hmm. writing that Henry is obviously one of those people that speaks into your life. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, in the name of Jesus is, you know, such an important work. And then the way that he unfolds and has talked about silence in the desert and um, that tradition is, it was a tradition that I wouldn't have been exposed to if it wasn't for Henry's work. And you know, that solitude and silence now is a, is something that I champion in my own life. And, um, so, you know, I don't even know where I'd be without Henry Nowen's writings. And, um, I have loved, I loved reading flying, falling, catching as well, and appreciated that, you know, so much as well, uh, illuminated so much more about his life than I think, we had even known, you know, up to this point, uh, yeah. even more intimately, the inner workings of his inner life um, and, and what he wrestled with. So um, again, it's it is his honesty coupled with um, his understanding of certain aspects of the spiritual life that at least for myself as a Protestant, I would not have been exposed to those dynamics of the spiritual life if it were not for Henry now. And, and not mm-hmm. just the fact that he wrote about it, but how he wrote about it, you know, mm-hmm. um, got it, you know, you could say got the hay down where the goats could get at it, you know, <laughs> in terms of these very lofty ideas uh, about solitude and silence and hey, Sakia, you know, we have to have somebody who can get it down to the level where you can actually take it in, which is what he nurtured. did. And mm-hmm. get nurtured. Yeah, that's right. Yes. That's right. Oh no. Henry's, Henry's a treasure for mm-hmm. his sheer honesty Yes, and for the battles he had, so many of us can identify with. That's right. We really can. The tyranny of the mm-hmm. urgent, the, right. the the need to be loved and to yes. be with his friends and to be needed and all those mm-hmm. different kinds of things. We are we are just in the process of producing something quite wonderful. It's called Under the Big Top with Henry Now and we've got oh. we're going to feature. Um, Carolyn Whitney Brown in the book, Flying, Falling, mm-hmm. Catching, and Bart Gavigan, who is mm-hmm. the director of Angels Over the Net. And we're going to meet um, Rodley Stevens, wow. who was a trapeze artist. Mm-hmm. It's a treasure of a book, a treasure of a program. It's going to be on yeah. our YouTube channel. In fact, mm-hmm. it starts tomorrow. So people, <gasps> wow. when they're listening to this podcast, mm-hmm. will be able to go to our YouTube channel, look for Under the Big Top with Henry Now. Mm-hmm. But what is probably richest in it, are the wonderful, wonderful comments from Henry. Oh, they're they're really deep. And so yeah. that's the way he was wired, that 
that psychologist, priest, uh, writer, thinker, friend, mm -hmm. broken healer, mm -hmm. the wounded healer. Yes. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I am excited about your book. I want people to be reading it. Uh, I'm challenged by it. You're you're going to be sending me off on certainly a better use of Sabbath. I I have managed to unplug, but I'm going to be even. I think more more deliberate in certain areas. But I would encourage, um, as you're listening, I, I want to encourage you to get this new book. It's really a treasure. Don't you love the title? Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest, From Sabbath to Sabbatical and Back Again. Honestly, Ruth's a great writer. It's very engaging and I really highly recommend it. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for your time and uh, for sharing with us your wisdom, uh, taking Thank us you. on the journey of your life and then helping oh. us go farther with that. Thank, Thank you. You. And thank you for such a thoughtful read of this new work. I really appreciate it. I can tell that you've engaged it really thoughtfully, and that means a lot to any author. So thank you so much, Karen. Oh, it's a lovely treat oh. to talk with you. Oh, Honestly, thank really you a so treat. Much. Thank the you. The Lord bless you. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I hope this interview with Ruth Haley Barton has inspired you to pursue having a genuine weekly Sabbath in your life. And maybe you're going to plan for a true sabbatical. That's pretty tempting for me, I must admit. You'll find links to this book and to all the things mentioned in this podcast on the podcast page of our website. We hope you'll share this podcast with your friends and family. If you've enjoyed it, please take time to give us a thumbs up or a good review. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.